This episode of Engineering the Future is brought to you by The Personal, Osby's home and auto insurance partner. These past few months have shown us just how important it is to have someone in your corner. When it comes to home and auto insurance, The Personal can be that someone. If you would like to learn more about this exclusive program, visit thepersonal.com slash Osby. This podcast is brought to you by Osby, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, the advocacy body for professional engineers in the engineering community in Ontario. Welcome to Engineering the Future, a podcast presented by the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers. I am your host, Jerome James. Today, I'm joined by Emily Thorncorte, a professional engineer and founder of and president of Thorne Associates, an energy and carbon management consulting firm. Emily is also the chair of OSPE's Energy Task Force and is a former OSPE board member. She is the recipient of the 2020 International Energy Engineer of the Year Award from the Association of Energy Engineers. Uh, thank you for joining me today, Emily. Um, I'm looking forward to this discussion around decarbonization, uh, which means reducing the amount of CO2 uh, going into the atmosphere uh, and energy management, which is the, it's all about optimizing our energy resources and minimizing the amount of energy we use in our day-to-day -day lives and in industry. Um, so to start off with, uh, can you start by elaborating on the concept of decarbonization versus energy management and how are they different and how do they complement each other uh, in your view? Thank you very much, Jerome. Happy to be here and thanks for uh, welcoming uh, me to your podcast. So in terms of uh, decarbonization versus energy management, I would say that the uh, fundamental goals, although they can be aligned, they can also be different. So energy management is typically focused on uh, energy cost reduction and energy waste uh, reduction. And decarbonization is really specifically about the carbon dioxide um, that is being released to the atmosphere. So they can sometimes be very much aligned whereby, uh, for example, fossil fuels um, are producing a lot of CO2, but by reducing their use, you'll reduce your energy costs as well. So those can be kind of one and the same. Where they can be different is in a um, clean electricity grid, uh, such as that of Ontario, then if you reduce your electricity, you will be um, improving your energy management by uh, improving or reducing your energy costs, your electricity costs. However, your contribution to decarbonization will actually be minimal because uh, reducing the electricity is already so clean anyways that reducing it substantially will only uh, provide very small benefit. Right. Interesting. Um, it how does that relate to um, carbon equivalence? I, I know that there's talk about um, measuring the effects of other gases being released by processes in industry. Um, can you uh, elaborate on what that's all about? So I believe you're referring to um, different types of greenhouse gases and their impact on um, the uh, climate change. And so each different types of, um, they actually go back to Kyoto uh, Accord gases, but now kind of Paris Accord gases, um, have different what are called global warming potential. And so uh, and th that actually, right. <laughs> surprisingly with the science, uh, it, it's revised, even though scientifically it's not actually changing, but our understanding of it is changing. So for um, CH4, methane, it's been revised, I think originally it was 24, and now the latest is 28, but it, it, you know, in and around about, I would say around 25 times um, as potent as uh, CO2. So we always oh, wow. talk in the carbon management world about CO2e, which is CO2 equivalent. And you have to be really careful because CO2 equivalent is that it's sort of a mathematical formula to account for all of the greenhouse gases, not just carbon dioxide. And the way that you account for it is through this global warming potential uh, value. Interesting. Um uh, the science has told us uh, through many different jurisdictions um, that 
putting a price on carbon is actually one of the most effective ways of reducing uh, energy uh, or carbon emissions in society. Uh, do you, uh, from in March, the Supreme Court uh, of Canada upheld uh, the country's federal carbon pricing law, uh, implying that uh, they do have the right to impose such a law uh, on the land, uh, clearing the way to mandate each province uh, to implement their own carbon pricing plans. Um, and if they do, don't have one uh, to the right standards, they can put out fines and, and, and whatnot. Um, what is your view on this and, and how does it relate to uh, the energy management field in uh, going forward in Canada? Yes, great question and important uh, policy changes. So I think this is a great uh policy um, change and that the most important thing is that it provides certainty in the price increase. It's going up from uh, in the past few years, it's gone up by $10 um, per ton of CO2 E. Um, and uh, then, but um, soon it's going to start by going up by $15 per ton. So the rate of increase each year is going to increase. And then by 20, um, 30 will be hitting uh, $170 per ton. So I think that certainty is, is really uh, critical. Um, first of all, I think that the price on carbon should be a nonpartisan issue. Um, actually, you know, putting prices on, you know, pollutants would actually normally be considered a sort of conservative idea or like the, the market, the idea of the market and et cetera. And so, um, uh, you know, like even the cap and trade program, you know, so I think that really all parties should should get behind the science and right. and they I think they are to each, you know, different extents. But, you know, um, they all are, which is which is great, because I think, uh, you know, we all live on the same planet and uh, we all need to together achieve this just as everybody has come together as a globe to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, everybody um, really needs to come together to, to fight climate change and have that same global coordination. 100%. Um, I definitely agree with your, your sentiments there. Um, is there a jurisdiction in the world that um, Canada that could look to, to see um, uh, places getting it right? on how to manage uh, emissions and, and reduce uh, carbon emissions and uh, reduce energy consumption overall. Um, is there a nation or a nation state, um, a, a province a, a, a in, the US, in, in, in India, in, in, in Europe, that's doing something correctly that we can uh, get behind as a, as, and hold as a mantle of, of success? I would say the EU, the European Union in general, um, like not one specific country, but sort of the EU as a whole has been uh, probably the best uh, worldwide uh, model. Canada is actually up among them. You know, we're, we're not doing so bad, so badly ourselves um, in terms of our targets. We actually have not not historically met the targets uh, ever, I believe. So that that's a different question. But setting targets, we're quite good at um, the, e <laughs> the EU, I think. Um, uh, is a little better be, at getting uh, achieving getting, those targets. Yes, yes. <laughs> So um, I personally always, when looking for sort of thought leadership, et cetera, turn to to Europe to um, to see what what different policies they're they're enacting, and I think that's a good good place um, to start. We hope you're enjoying this episode so far. At Ospi, we're here for you, making sure government, media, and the public are listening to the voice of engineers. You can learn more at ospi.on.ca. Switching gears a little bit, I want to go back to um, your work at OSPI and um, involvement in the Energy Task Force. Could you tell me some of the interesting topics that um, you guys are working on and uh, what's the future for OSPI's involvement in this space? Yes, definitely. Actually, the Energy Task Force um, is very much aligned with decarbonization. There's also an environmental task force that uh, we aim to try and collaborate uh, on, on joint issues. And right now, the Energy Task Force um, 
we are working on two main areas. Uh, one is the clean thermal energy. So um, if you look at sort of areas where there's still lots of carbon in um, in the sort of Ontario, I guess, uh, uh, landscape, then as I mentioned, our electricity is actually not the place to look because it's already uh, very, very clean. What is the place to look is buildings, right. uh, hence mm. the clean thermal energy, looking at heat pumps for anyone who's, you know, furnace, if they're natural gas furnace, which is a lot of um, Ontarians or more rural, even propane, et cetera. If you can get to a heat pump that's with electric, clean electricity, that's a fantastic and huge carbon reduction that you know our listeners, OSPE members, can personally undertake. Um, we at my house actually we're doing an addition and we're um, planning to uh, install a heat pump for that uh, addition. And um, so we're doing at OSPE the the clean thermal energy. Another area is energy storage. So um, you know everybody's talking about uh, renewable energy and how it's um, sometimes unreliable because it depends on the when the wind blows and the sun shines. Well, the key, of course, is to that it, uh, is energy storage and affordable energy storage. So uh, right. we are evaluating the economics related to that. And then a final initiative that um, we released uh, a little while ago, but we're trying to um, push to become sort of policy is related to changing of retail electricity pricing plans. And the change would enable electric vehicle owners to uh, be able to take advantage of very low prices. I'm talking about, you know, around the one cent per kilowatt hour instead of, for example, the, the tariff changes, but say 15 cents. So, I mean, it's going to be more than uh, a 10 times a decrease um, if the policy that we're um, advocating is uh, is enacted. So we're also oh, wow. hoping that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, where is the state of technology with regards to energy storage? Is it still being developed? Uh, is it just a, a will kind of thing right now? Um, is it better to look at uh, uh, utility grade storage as a, as a solution or personal storage, uh, decentralized storage? Uh, what would you say this, where the science is on energy storage right now? So there's many different types of energy storage. And once we release the, port, the report, you'll actually see, um, you know, chemical energy storage, electrical energy storage, mechanical energy storage. Um, so th there's a whole bunch of different uh, thermal energy storage um, technologies, and they are all at different, and within those even sort of their different levels of, um, I would say, technology readiness or commercial towards commercialization. So... I think the most advanced would be your traditional electrical batteries like lithium ion, and they are definitely, you know, ready now for, for grid scale, utility scale. They are being implemented. Um, the cost has come down significantly. It will continue, in my opinion, to uh, come down substantially. So just as we saw wind and solar have those dramatic, um, you know, drops in price, energy storage is already, it's behind in terms of its development compared to to the renewable energy technologies, but it's it's uh, coming. Right. So it yeah, it's very insightful. Um, I wanted to switch gears now um, and talk about your journey and how you got to be where you are in in such a male dominated uh, industry. Uh, how did you get started in in uh, uh, energy management uh, within engineering and? Uh, yeah, if you can tell us a little bit about your journey to where you are now and tell us about some of the work that you're you're doing within your company. Definitely. I mean, I think a lot starts as a child and I was fortunate enough, my uh, both my parents, but my mom in particular, uh, really um, pushed the my abilities in, in math and encouraged me. And so when many of actually other girls were um, maybe thinking they weren't as good in math, even if they actually were fine or even really good, then um, I was not discouraged. And I kind of always loved um, and felt good at math and science. And I think that's really important. And then the next really important step is that I actually chose in high school to take the right courses. So I took all whatever six math and science that were needed 
the requisite courses to get into a university engineering program without at the time when I chose the courses, I didn't actually even know what engineering was. So I'm the first engineer in the family. And um, I remember when I learned what engineering was, it was uh, back, I'm, I'll be <laughs> dating myself, but at the time in guidance counselors, um, we would go in and there were books. So there was no really internet being used and um, in high school. And so you would go to the book of the university and I went to Waterloo and I found out, oh, engineering is applied math and science. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever because um, I didn't like the idea of theoretical. I never liked proofs in math or anything like that, but I loved the, the practical. Um, I actually, as a kid, wanted to cure cancer, but but I can't stand being in hospitals or anything like that. So I, or, you know, I banded that quickly and I thought this gears. engineering yeah. Yeah, thing was really great. So yeah, from there, you know, got accepted into engineering at Waterloo. Um, and, uh, and then after school, um, I did my master's as well, uh, did a very broad engineering. So I did it in my undergrad in, um, systems design engineering, which is kind of like industrial, but it, it is really actually just sort of generic. And, um, and then I kind of, uh, I guess I, I fell into a passion, which is fuel cells. Um, and uh, so I read an article in the Globe and Mail about fuel cells, and I thought this is the coolest technology ever. And so I decided to do my fourth year university project, and then I actually worked uh, in the field, did my master's uh, specializing uh, in fuel cells, uh, also in mechanical engineering, and then went right into the work uh, world in, uh, in the fuel cell space. Um, and then to sort of end off, you asked how I got into energy management after five years in fuel cells. Um, at the time, that was, uh, I guess, around 2000, or, sorry, 2008 or so. Um, the fuel cells were still nowhere near commercialization at that point, And I thought it was important to broaden um, my, my future career prospects. Right. And so um, energy management uh, seemed to be a bit uh, broader and went into an engineering consulting company at that point. Um, stayed there for almost a decade and then decided to uh, found Thorne Associates um, about three and a half years ago and never looked back. Loved the entrepreneurial life and uh, just hired actually our uh, first full-time permanent employee. So we're very excited about that too. That's great. What kind of work are you guys uh, involved in currently? In yeah, so... Yeah. Um, we have some really uh, exciting new projects. Actually, uh, we're doing a global <clears throat> climate change strategy for a mining company. Uh, we're also working with an industry association on a low carbon reduction roadmap and an energy intensity benchmarking. Um, and we're also just been awarded some funding from an innovation fund um, and uh, I can't talk about that because it's confidential, highly confidential, but uh, basically, yeah, taking a sort of proof of concept through to demonstration with a partner, et cetera. So, yeah, some really exciting work. That's great. And it was it was great to hear about your background. Um, uh, little do the the listeners know that uh, we both wrote our master's thesis on the same technology, both did <laughs> yes. something in, a, in fuel cells back in the day. So that's yes. uh, a little similar common thread between the two of us. Um, yeah, uh, I want to ask you about engineers and engineering in general. Uh, what should the average engineer be thinking about when they think about sustainability? Is this only for energy management engineers or should the common everyday engineer be thinking about these concepts? And if so, uh, how can they implement smart sustainability into their everyday practice? That's a great question, Jerome. I would say, uh, first of all, 100% uh, non-energy management or carbon engineers uh, should, uh, yeah, 100%, I would hope, uh, be thinking about sustainability. All engineers, even if you're not an expert in that field, um, have an advantage over the general population in terms of the contribution that we can make um, because of our technical expertise um, and ability to problem solve and ability to think critically and understand complex information. So um, first of all, I think, again, we have those abilities. And then um, in terms of putting them into action, there was actually uh, a fantastic um, report from the former uh, Ontario Environmental Commissioner. Unfortunately, the Environmental Commission office was uh, was decommissioned. Um, but the last report that they put out uh, before it was uh, the, 
the office was no longer, was on the average Ontarian's um, carbon footprint. And it's quite interesting. Um, the top four uh, thing, things that um, account for over 50% of the average Ontarian's carbon footprint are number one in order, driving. We're not doing as much of that. This was pre-pandemic, but still, <laughs> you know, it'll come back. So we need to get to our right. EVs and we do have mm -hmm. an EV, which is fantastic. Number two after driving is uh, home heating. So uh, we need to um, reduce our um, our again, carbon footprint with or heating through, for example, heat pumps, uh, flying. So flying, um, again, I can't actually, those might be two and three, but certainly the flying has gone down because no one's flying. But when we do go back, uh, what we do is we have family in Europe, we do fly, but we at least purchase carbon offsets. It's not um, perfect, but electric airplanes are coming as well. Uh, sooner than we think, short haul should be available for 2025. And wow, that's close. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's closer than most people think. And Canada, actually, on BC, we did one of the first electric flights um, either in 2019 or 2020. Um, sort of still testing, and and but anyways, uh, it's uh, they, they exist. Electric planes are just uh, can't yet get, I guess, commercially purchased flights. And the last one is eating beef. So I would say to the average Ontarian, you know. Um, on your carbon footprint, that's specific. And then also just generally, if you can reduce your waste, don't buy as many clothes, don't buy as many toys for your kids. Um, try and reuse from your family, uh, both, you know, clothes and toys, et cetera, um, when you can and just try and generally reduce waste. For sure. And I've, I've started to read re press releases from car companies talking about, um, ditching the internal combustion engine altogether by a certain date and um, rolling out electric lines that you never even dreamed that it would be happening so quickly from SUVs right down to, you know, your subcompact. Um, these things are moving very quickly right now. Absolutely. I think, again, faster than most people would have realized. I believe there was three different announcements in Ontario of new um, EV electric vehicle um, manufacturing that, that's happening or going in the works. And that that's huge. That's great. We have our mining resources that can, you know, mine different components that are needed for um electric vehicles and we have lots of smart engineers to do all the consulting and <laughs> engineering design and all of that to to make that happen so right. um, Ontario could be a, a real uh, leader in the EV uh, world and and it's a huge market it's the only market actually that's going to be there in the future um, so we need to get on board and every EV owner that I know myself included uh, would never go back to an internal combustion engine they're just so fun, quiet, they're fast, um, and in addition to just not polluting, right? And so mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're great. Excellent. Uh, thank you for your insights today on, on all things energy management and decarbonization. I have one last question for you, and that um, is with regards to OSPI. You're such a great OSPI ambassador and involved in so many things within OSPI. Uh, can you answer the question why you are an OSPI member? Yes, I guess uh, many, many different reasons. Uh, probably the first or most important reason is that I think it's essential that we advocate to government so that they can hear the engineer's perspective mm -hmm. and that government can therefore enact technically sound policies. Again, I'll um, parallel it to the COVID crisis. The government has, uh, you know, tried generally, there's been Anyways, generally to listen to, you know, the medical scientific community and try or they should, you know, ha anyways, we'll say that they have been trying to listen or at least publicly announce that. Right. So right. I think the same goes on the energy management carbon space that we need to really make sure that government is hearing the engineer's perspective. So I, I would say that's the number one. And then for all the listeners um, who might not understand the power and importance of advocacy, because that takes a bit of time in your journey and if you're earlier in your career I mean I would just say I started with a salary survey that alone uh, is a reason to join OSPI that was the original reason way back when I was a student that alone is reason enough and then there's all these other benefits um, in terms of insurance etc but uh, but the advocacy is uh, really the key piece
Thank you so much for joining us today, Emily. Uh, Emily Thorne Corte is a professional engineer and founder and president of Thorne Associates, an energy carbon and carbon management consulting firm. Thank you so much, Jerome. From all of us at OSPI, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, thanks for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode.